The NSA has trillions of telephone calls and emails in their databases that they've collected over the last several years. Why shouldn't you, Mr. Greenwald, be charged with a crime? Since breaking the story of NSA surveillance abuses, Glenn Greenwald has championed the cause of whistleblowers and schooled establishment journalists in the meaning of the First Amendment. For his efforts, government officials have publicly called for Greenwald's arrest. He won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service, and today he's the subject of Citizen Four, an Academy Award-nominated documentary about Edward Snowden. So I don't know anything about you. Okay. Uh, my name is Edward Snowden. Uh, I go by Ed. Um, Edward Joseph Snowden is the full name. The winner of Reason Foundation's 2014 Lanny Friedlander Prize not only has broken the biggest news story in a generation, he's following it up by co-founding The Intercept, a magazine that aims to shake up American journalism. Reason TV caught up with Greenwald in Montreal, where he was delivering a lecture at McGill University about terrorism and government surveillance. Glenn Greenwald, it is a pleasure to talk to you. Great to talk to you, and, and thank you so much to, to Reason for this award, too. I'm, I'm really honored to receive it. So let's, let, let's get right into it. I, 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 I loved your book, uh, No Place to Hide. It reads in many ways like an all of the president's men for the 21st century, with you and Laura Poitras playing the role of Woodward and Bernstein, and where they differ sort of is what really interests me, uh, uh, even though it's sort of a timeless tale. Uh, right at the end of All the President's Men, you have uh, a president who resigns. You have people who go to jail. Uh, you have some measure of accountability. Uh, that's the end game, and I don't know if we're quite at the end game here with this scenario, but do you see that ever happening? Do you see uh, a, some measure of accountability? or? Today, have things changed to such a degree where the government just acts with impunity? I do. Um, you know, I mean, even in, in Watergate, uh, that took a, a, a relatively long time from the uh, original disclosures to the point where Washington, the political class, took it seriously to the point where there was accountability. And in fact, if you look at the first year and a half or two years of Watergate reporting, um, overwhelmingly polling broke down along partisan lines where Republicans were rather dismissive of the seriousness of what was being reported and Democrats were sort of trying to exploit it for political gain. And it was only once it kind of reached a tipping point and some prominent Republicans came out and said, um, this is really wrong. And then the battle over the, the tapes um, did it also of unfold the way we now remember it, but it, it, it took a, a good while. Um, the nature of politically powerful people is that they have a lot of defenses and a lot of strength by definition, and, and you don't um, deflate them or bring them down or, or um, hold them accountable easily. It, it's always a battle. But I do think there have been a very um, some very significant changes as a result of the reporting. There hasn't been a lot of legislation passed. In fact, there's been none, at least yet, that has restricted what the NSA can do. But I've never thought that the way to look the place to look for restrictions on the power of the U.S. government would be the U.S. government itself, because human beings just generally don't walk around thinking about ways to restrict their own power. I think the much more significant changes are the changes in consciousness that people have, not just about surveillance, but about privacy, the role of government, their relationship to it, the dangers of, of, of exercising power in the dark, um, and uh, the role of journalism as well. Um, and I think there's all kinds of ways that surveillance is now being curbed from other governments acting in coalition to impede U.S. hegemony over the internet to technology companies like Facebook and Yahoo and Google, knowing that unless they make a real commitment to protecting their users' privacy, they're going to lose a generation of users to other countries' companies. Um, and then most important of all is the, the awareness of individuals about the need to protect their own privacy by using things like encryption um, and other their tools of anonymity. And I think these things are a really important form of um, change and accountability that will come from the reporting. Is time also a factor? Because I know you do mention this in the book. Uh, in, in, in the, uh, initially, there's a, a fear of surveillance, and there's a shock. And then over time, you get used to the cameras being on you. And I, I know this just as a photojournalist. Uh, in the beginning, you put a camera on someone, and they're nervous. They're worried about their appearance. And then after an hour, it's like, oh, it's, it's not even there anymore. Does that dilute the urgency in any way? I think there, there is definitely um, an extent to which you can normalize almost every form of abusive behavior on the part of the state. You can 
pretty much a custom of population to almost anything. Um, there are studies at, that show that at the end of the Stasi, when the wall in East Germany fell, and, and even once East Germans became integrated into the West, or into, at least into Germany, it's a reunified Germany, that Behaviorally, um, it took a long time for East Germans to change from a population under this repressive, tyrannical microscope of surveillance to one that was free, um, because they had become acculturated to simply accepting the world um, with those kinds of limitations. But I also think that there is an instinctive drive that human beings have for, for privacy, for having a place where we can go and think and, and communicate and, and act without the judgmental eyes of other people being cast upon us because we understand reflexively how important that is to be able to dissent and explore who we are. Um, and so I don't ever see a, a, a time when people will be satisfied with having no privacy in the digital age. I do want to talk about just whether the NSA blanket surveillance is now, you know, is legal, legally permissible under any possible interpretation of the law, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's important to understand when we talk about what's legal, is the extent to which our institutions that determine legality have been completely co-opted, either by the other branches of government or just by the kind of post-9-11 fear-mongering and hysteria that has subsumed federal judges as much as they have everybody else, if not more so. Um, take the Patriot Act, for example. If you, that, is, the Patriot Act, Section 215 of the Patriot Act, is the provision that the Justice Department cited to convince the FISA court to allow the NSA to collect all telephone records from Verizon and Sprint and every other major carrier, the metadata of every person with whom every other American is communicating. That was the legal provision that was cited. It was Section 215 of the Patriot Act. If you go back and look at the debate that took place over the Patriot Act, and there was a debate over the, the Patriot Act, even in the wake of 9-11, there were lots of people standing up and saying, this is really alarming, this is going to vest extremist surveillance power in the government. Nobody thought neither the proponents of the Patriot Act who wrote it, like Jim Sensenbrenner, um, who were devoted to extremist power in the wake of 9-11, nor the critics of the Patriot Act who were motivated to depict as extremist of a picture of the legislation as they could. Nobody remotely dreamed that that law could ever be cited to justify mass indiscriminate surveillance on Americans. All it did was lower the standard so that you no longer needed probable cause, but a much lower level of proof of suspicion, reasonable suspicion, to target somebody for surveillance. And yet a FISA court ended up accepting this rendition of the Patriot Act in secret that nobody thinks that it plausibly permits. And, and so that's really become the problem is the law almost is irrelevant. It gets twisted and distorted by the very institutions that are supposed to safeguard it to justify almost anything the government wants to do. It sounds like a very similar situation to how torture and waterboarding was, was permitted, right? Right. I mean, the law is, you know, in its most idealized form, it's this consistent, objective, concrete, um, identifiable set of rules and principles that constrict people's behavior. Um, but in reality, the laws, like everything else, is an instrument that those who wield the greatest power can use to maximize their power and to shield themselves from challenge and, and protection. And you're exactly right. Um, nobody thought waterboarding and these other techniques were anything but illegal criminal torture. In fact, um, the U.S. government has prosecuted people for using them on, exactly on that theory, but legal memos got written. Um, courts have, if not accepted them, accepted the fact that their existence justified the decisions. Um, and so they just become legal by sort of fiat power. Um, and, and that's why, although when I began writing about politics as a journalist, I focused a lot on legal questions. I almost never focus on them now because um, they're really not relevant to the struggle for um, power or, or um, popular opinion. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the, the Intercept. Can you explain just what is the Intercept, first of all, and what is it going to provide uh, what is it going to provide to the public that isn't already out there in, in this diverse world of media in which we live? So it's a little difficult to describe what The Intercept is because it's still very much a work in progress. What it is technically is a, a digital magazine that was co-founded by myself, Jeremy Scahill, and Laura Poitras, and it's funded by First Look Media, which is headed by Piero Midiara, the, the founder of eBay. The idea behind it when we began was that there had there's been fundamental flaws in American journalism 
that we wanted to set out. I wouldn't say to rectify because that's too much of an ambitious aspiration, um, but to at least start to work to produce other models. Um, and I think you know the central flaw that we well there are two central flaws I think we wanted to rectify. One was the fact that most well-funded institutional media outlets have become, for a variety of reasons, far too close to and deferential to those who wield the greatest political and economic power as opposed to adversarial to it and therefore have kind of gutted the purpose of journalism, which is to serve as a check on those who wield power, not as a kind of uncritical servant or amplifier of their message. Um, and then the second uh, flaw that we, we wanted to rectify was the kind of lack of vibrancy and independence and in how journalists are allowed to report and opine and talk about the world. There's kind of become this very soul-draining, soulless um, voice that journalists are expected to adopt. It's sort of one of contrived neutrality or objectivity um, that prevents them from really having any passion or spirit behind their journalism. Um, and we really wanted to reanimate the idea of what journalism was supposed to be, which is not this kind of cloistered profession um, that follows all these archaic unwritten rules that really just kind of neuters it, um, but instead was, was, was about crusading for some kind of outcome or against a particular injustice and that means letting journalists be free to pursue their own voice and, and not try and homogenize them or, or neuter them. I followed your uh, debate with Bill Keller. Right. Uh, I, was, I thought that was terrific by the way. Both You're both really on opposite sides of that coin. Uh, but what I didn't maybe uh, gather entirely from that, uh, this idea of what's the future of journalism, you know, is it is it objective old uh, or not so old as you pointed out, but you know, the uh, this sort of established standard yeah. of objective news or sub, uh, you know, intensely subjective and more adversarial. Uh, is there room for both? There's a couple of new media outlets that are making really um, ambitious claims about reinventing journalism in whatever the image is that they want to do. Um, and we've tried really hard to avoid that. We're not trying to reinvent journalism. Like We don't think we have the model of how journalism should be um, practiced. We have a model of journalism that we think has been woefully lacking. Um, and, you know, if there are media outlets that um, want to do different things, I think, um, you know, there's definitely other ways to do journalism besides we do them that contribute value. But I do think that the prevailing model um, is actually quite destructive, in part because it's fraudulent. This idea that the New York Times or the Washington Post um, talks about the world and reports on the world without biases or subjectivity or opinions. Um, as human beings, I just think we in, we, we perceive the world through a subjective prism. Um, we're not capable of, of the kind of objectivity to which these media outlets claim um, they're, 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 they're capable of. And I think it's much more honest to simply be candid about the subjective assumptions that you're embracing um, rather than to uh, pretend that you're, you're something that you're not. But more to the point, I think that that kind of pseudo-objective journalism renders it, um, it neuters it. It means that if you can't really ever be perceived as taking a strong position because that somehow compromises your objectivity, um, it means that you basically are toothless, that you no longer have the ability to check those who are in power or to um, call out their lies when they're lying or to um, be aggressive in, in telling the truth. And I think that's a big part of why journalism has been failing. And is that is that really at heart the promise of new media today? That it can engage in different ways of looking at things and with a multitude of different voices? Yeah, I think, I mean, diversity of voices is probably the most important part of how the internet has affected journalism because it really is true it's it's an amazingly rapid and fundamental change in how information and news gets delivered to people I mean 10 years ago if you wanted to have just 10 years ago if you wanted to find a large platform where you could reach large numbers of people um, you pretty much had to go to work for one of these large institutions and subject yourself to all of their really constrictive rules for how journalism is supposed to be done um, now you know you can just start a blog on the internet and if you offer something something unique, um, you'll find a big readership and you're free of all these constraints or you don't even need to start a blog. I mean, if you look at how the Israeli war on Gaza was perceived, which I think was much different around the world than prior Israeli incursions into Gaza were perceived, the primary reason that happened is because 
everybody in Gaza essentially was a journalist because they all have cell phones with video capabilities and then internet access that they could upload things to Twitter. And it really has democratized the number of people and the kinds of voices who are shaping how we perceive the world. And I think that's all for the good. And it gives you a leg up a little bit because when you were struggling to get the very first dispatches of the Snowden story out, right, you had the option of saying, well, if they keep delaying, if they keep postponing, um, I can set up my own website and publish it that way. Can, can you talk a little bit about how that actually gave you a, a little bit of an advantage you wouldn't have otherwise had before you would have been completely reliant on the on the mainstream? Definitely. I mean, just imagine pre-internet, for example. Um, if you go and talk to Daniel Osberg about the challenges that he faced when he wanted to disseminate the Pentagon Papers, the first challenge that he faced was simply a logistical one of how do you make a Xerox copy of 7,000 top secret pages um, without detection? Like, do you go into the, a drugstore or a library with a stack of dimes and, you know, start copying the Pentagon Papers. But then more so, there were very few uh, media outlets capable of publishing it and disseminating it in any way that would make an impact. I mean, there were a small handful of them, and most of them were afraid and, and had all kinds of restrictions. And the New York Times finally undertook the fight, but if they hadn't, he might have been prevented from having that heard um, in any meaningful way. And the internet has completely obliterated that monopoly that these small number of large corporations, media companies, have on our discourse. And you're absolutely right. I mean, when, you know, this is the first story that I really did at The Guardian where I had to work directly with their their editors um, because my, my arrangement with every publication where I had written, both my own blog and Salon prior to that and The Guardian, was that I just write what I want to write. I upload it directly to the internet, no editor reviews it, let alone changes it. Um, but obviously, with a story of this magnitude, with the legal liability and the journalistic challenges, I had to work with The Guardian. And I, I was a little bit, I, there was no basis of trust because we hadn't worked together on on any kind of a story. And so any sign at all from them that they weren't going to be as aggressive as I wanted to be in publishing this um, did made me make me start considering other alternatives. And the fact that I did have other alternatives, that I could have just published it all on my own site and made as big of an impact, or at least certainly close to it, gave me a lot of leverage to be able to um, negotiate with them and reach an agreement about how the reporting should be done. Yeah, that was a, that was an amazing part of the story. Where literally we're talking about minutes before this uh, self-imposed deadline you you gave the Guardian, right? Uh, right. I mean, you know, a, a big part of it was. Um, we had just seen this 29-year-old kid um, who grew up with no. You know, grew up in a totally ordinary way with no background of, of power or position or prestige, um, undertake this extraordinary, extraordinarily brave act, um, knowing that he was sacrificing his life to do it. And so I wanted to make sure that the reporting that was done on the materials he had furnished was done within the same ethos of boldness and fearlessness and, and courage. Um, and I was worried that the Guardian institutionally would be resistant to that. And ultimately, they weren't. Um, that courage not only was contagious and infused me and Laura and, and, and the other people with whom we were directly working with the Guardian as well, but I think a big part of it was the fact that you no longer need these big institutions, and they know that, and so they've become much more flexible in what they're willing to do. Say The Intercept were to become very uh, successful. Uh, what is to prevent it from sort of falling into that trap and becoming the same old sort of establishment uh, publication that you criticize, say, the Washington Post for being it many times. I mean, you're going to have to, you're gonna, to break big stories and to keep alive, right, you're going to have to hire risk-averse lawyers, right, you're going to have to have a, a hierarchy of, of editors and people who take orders from other people and who are responsible for different parts of the operation. Um, this is just part of, isn't that just part of uh, having a news operation? Yeah, I mean, the danger is definitely there, uh, but, but because this kind of journalistic ethos is not just something that we kind of is on our checklist of things we hope to achieve, but is central to everything that all of us who began The Intercept believe in at our core. Um, structuring our organization to avoid those dangers has been the by far the first and overarching priority. So when we went to hire lawyers, we purposely went and hired lawyers who would be risk-seeking and not risk-averse. And that was one of the kind of core mandates of what we were doing was that unlike media outlets that are suffering financially and therefore tell their lawyers, make sure to keep us out of expensive litigation that we can't afford with governments or large corporations, we've told our lawyers, um, we want to seek out litigation um, when someone's threatening our journalistic freedom to be able to litigate in defense of it and, and fight for it. That's one of the advantages of being extremely well-funded. Um, 
or hierarchically in how we structure ourselves, we don't want to impose in this top-down way editors who are now the bosses of journalists who these journalists have to kind of get around or convince to allow them to publish. The journalists went and hired the editors with whom they're working and they work very collaboratively and there is no kind of strict hierarchical or rigid um, sequence where nothing can get published unless an editor says, yes, you can publish this. And and so that danger does exist. Um, but we're trying to construct everything so that it's infused with this spirit of fearless independent journalism so that we don't become the Washington Post. Interesting. I mean, culture goes a long way, institutional culture, right? I mean, sure. uh, at, at reason, I feel like there's a, a similar kind of culture, actually, where there's a general tone, but we're, each one of us is given a tremendous amount of leeway to shape stories the way right, we Right, and there's want. writers at, at the region who I think agree with each other a lot, but also disagree with each other quite a lot. And there's writers who have very um, distinctive voices, but there seems to be this kind of spirit that you want people who are sort of idiosyncratic and independent and have strong voices. And, and I do think that's an important part of keeping journalism not just relevant, but interesting. And, and sort of the funding too, the economic side of journalism is really changing. And what's interesting is uh, you're not following the old models. They're in a way following you, right? I mean, if you look at the Washington Post, uh, which which you talk about a lot in the book, they're actually following the intercept model now, right? right. A billionaire comes over and starts and takes over the joint and starts hiring unusual, different uh, voices that are, were never part of the mainstream before and giving them a bigger platform than ever before. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not one who thinks that finding billionaires is certainly not the only model to save journalism and and it's not necessarily a very desirable one um, because there are dangers to having one person with huge economic power being the primary if not sole owner and funder of a news organization the temptation to influence it is always going to be very potent um, and even if it's not overt it can be a chilling kind of um, effect where the people at these or, or institutions know what the funder and owner want and believe and, and kind of just subconsciously avoid doing things that might alienate him. Um, and so the only reason why we were willing to do it is because we became very convinced that the particular billionaire who happens to be funding our news organization um, a is really committed to the idea of journalistic independence. Um, he could have bought the Washington Post if he had wanted to and purposely didn't because he didn't want to kind of inherit one of these legacy media outlets. He wanted to do something different. Um, and B, he's also extremely well aware that the minute he tried to interfere in any remote way with what we were doing would be the very minute that all of us would leave and the whole thing would just not exist anymore. Um, but there are hazards to that model as well. But um, you know, all of these models for sustaining journalism in a meaningful way are imperfect and you just have to try and minimize the flaws and, and maximize the value. I'd like to go to the question, this question, which I really think is such a key aspect of your book. Uh, and in some ways, it's the story of Snowden is really just a springboard for, I think, some larger philosophical issues that you really get into about uh, who gets to be considered an insider in the establishment and who's an outsider. I think that that this dynamic is, I, I wouldn't necessarily say universal because that's probably too great of a claim, but it's it's extremely common across cultures and, and, and eras. The idea that orthodoxies are maintained by imposing punishment for those who defy them. I think it's always the case or most often the case that there are that the path of least resistance is to embrace and act in accordance with societal convention and there are generally punishments for deviating from that convention. Um, and so a big part of it is just simply that normal human dynamic that um, people who uh, wield power have an interest in having the status quo or the prevailing order maintained. And one important way of doing that is to ensure that there are penalties for those who challenge it. Um, and I do think one important penalty that gets imposed on those who challenge it is the idea of societal scorn or shame. Um, that you'll be depicted in, in the terms that you've described as crazy um, or unstable um, or, you know, I mean, as I said, you can find uh, Soviet and Chinese dissidents who were put into mental hospitals rather than prisons on the grounds that they were crazy for challenging the prevailing order. Um, scientists like Galileo and Copernicus were, and Socrates um, in, in philosophy were regarded similarly. Um, and so I, I think there's a very important component of it there. Um, and and, and I think one of the reasons why journalists who are very amply rewarded um, become such reliable servants of power is because they too have an interest in preserving the status quo. 
But this concept of craziness is, is remarkable. There was actually a fantastic article written in 2010 in Newsweek by Connor Friedersdorf, the now uh, writer at Newsweek, um, when, I forget exactly the context, but either Rand Paul or Ron Paul, I believe it was Rand Paul, had made a few statements um, and got vilified for being crazy. And, and Con or the craziest person in Washington. And Connor wrote an article saying, you can think some of those views are crazy and they certainly don't have very much support. So they're probably by definition on the fringe. But it's important to remember that even the most popular opinions or the things that are done by those who seem like they're the guardians of convention can also be really crazy. Like the idea of being able to target an American citizen for execution by drone without due process um, is actually a really radical and one could say crazy idea. And if it were being proposed by some fringe ideologue rather than being done by a popular American president, um, it would be regarded as just so self-evidently crazy. Um, and this is a term that gets applied, I think, to any dissidents, to any people who express fringe views. It's just a way of kind of delegitimizing um, views that challenge convention and orthodoxy without having to do the work to engage them. And yet at the same time, you make the point that it's absolutely crucial that journalists be outsiders. Well, I'll give you an example. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, before we began the, 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 the discussion, but um, you know, we're in, in Montreal right now. Last night I was in Toronto, um, and I gave a speech to a audience of several hundred people who were largely supportive and, and, and sympathetic of the work that I had done. Um, and yet there was a discussion as part of this event where I was asked about um, a recent uh, attack that's being called a, a, a terrorist attack in Canada. This week's events are a grim reminder that Canada is not immune to the types of terrorist attacks we have seen elsewhere around the world. And I made some points about the role that Canada had played in potentially provoking these kind of attacks, the causal relationship between Canadian foreign policy on the one hand and the desire of, of Muslims to bring violence to Canada on the other. Um, and I could tell it made the audience extremely uncomfortable, notwithstanding the fact that they were there largely to support what I was doing and probably agreed with me on most things. And I remember after, I, and I had mentioned that I had intended to write about it that day, um, but didn't have time, but I was going to write about it for sure the next day, which was which is today. And someone afterwards, a, a journalist who works in Canada, who I've worked with, came up to me and said, you know, you should really think twice about whether you want to write that because you could tell how uncomfortable it made even your supporters and it's probably going to cause you a lot of grief if you do it. So you might want to think twice about doing it. And I said, well, that's actually all the more reason to do it, right? That's my role. My role is not, as a journalist, is not to give comfort. I'm not a therapist or a nurse or, um, you know, a, a, a pastor. Um, I mean, I I think one of the most crucial parts of journalism is to constantly poke and prod at um, convention and orthodoxy and to challenge assumptions that people are just implicitly accepting, um, not just even if it makes people uncomfortable, but especially then. Um, I think you need um, always to have every kind of human belief being challenged and, and scrutinized and, um, and, and put under a microscope, and I think that's an important part of what journalism is about. It is, but I mean, do you romanticize that aspect of the journalistic sort of viewpoint a little bit. I mean, for example, uh, yes, you've come under fire from a lot of journalists uh, and people calling for your imprisonment in right. some cases and all that. But isn't that just part of what you're actually promoting, which is adversarial journalism? That no, sure. some, some people are going to look at you in a, in a really negative light, right? They're going to ask you the same kind of hard questions that you would ask of the NSA, for example. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, journalists tend to be really thin-skinned. I think sometimes journalists, especially in the internet age, where, where was, is really the first time that journalists had to be confronted with criticism. Um, you know, 10 years ago, if you wrote a column for the New York Times, if you were Maureen Dowd or Tom Friedman, the only criticisms you ever heard were people who wrote letters to the editor and got published, and none of them ever cared at all about that. Um, now, you know, everywhere they go, Tom Friedman and Maureen Dowd hear constant, and you know, sometimes the criticism is, is vicious and it, it's vitriolic and it's personal and unproductive and, and whatever, um, but I think that world where people who have a platform and any kind of influence over public discourse, um, I'd rather have those people, and I include myself in that, subjected to excessive criticism and attack than insufficient criticism and attack. Okay, well, I, ho I hope you read that Matt Taibbi famous 
famous uh, world is flat. Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, he, that must have gotten to him, right? I, I, would... I mean, there's no question. <laughs> Tom Friedman is well aware of that essay. But you document a very long list of, of uh, uh, establishment journalists who have called for your arrest in many cases, uh, and some of them actually apologize to you, right? Like Andrew Ross Sorkin right. did, David Gregory has afterwards. I would arrest him, and now I'd almost arrest uh, Glenn Greenwald, who's the, the, the journalist, journalist who seems to be out there. Almost, he wants to help him get to Ecuador. I put my foot in my mouth, and I'm sorry about this, uh, when I veered into hyperbole and suggested that he almost be arrested. That was the quote, and I have to say, it didn't come out right, and I misspoke. I know they apologize, but did they ever explain what prompted that accusation? It's a very strange thing to say, you should go to prison, I'm sorry I said that. Like, what prompts, did they explain what prompts that? Andrew Ross Sorkin did apologize. Um, he apologized both on Twitter and then on air um, and he, I, I don't recall exactly what he said but I think the essence of it was that he had just kind of gotten so caught up in the emotions of watching this person that he thinks had committed treason or serious crimes Edward Snowden essentially get away with it by by being able to remain outside the grasp of the US and that to the extent I had any kind of a role in that he felt like I should have to pay a price for that as well. Um, and even that you know, view, although more mild than the view that I should be imprisoned, is itself really questionable because you know, he is a journalist at the New York Times, which is a history of defending leakers and sources and actually going to court all the way up to the Supreme Court to win the right to publish huge amounts of top secret material um, when the government was trying to suppress them to do so. And so the fact that there's this prominent New York Times columnist who views what Edward Snow Snowden did, not as an act of um, courage or at the very least enabling journalism, but as an act of treason and criminality, I think underscores how closely identified these journalists now are with those who wield power. The government looks at Edward Snowden understandably as a criminal and as an enemy, um, and therefore these journalists who see the world through the prism of the government do as well. So a lot of the revelations that you came across uh, from uh, from Snowden, uh, they have uh, in many ways proven to be more outrageous than even the most sort of creative conspiracy theorists could have ever imagined. And I, you even write about how shocked you were personally. And I'm, I'm wondering, did that have an impact on how, you know, or even whether you view uh, our government as a, in general, as a force for good? Did it make you more skeptical about it? Definitely. Um, I don't see how it can not do that. Um, you know, I've been writing about the dangers of, of state surveillance, U.S. surveillance, for a lot of years. Um, and have been, you know, we've gotten little snippets of, of the magnitude of the surveillance, just how unaccountable and out of control it is. But to see the sheer breadth of it, the fact that their explicit uh, institutional ambition is to collect all communications on the Internet, literally all, um, is is something that is is difficult to explain in terms of how you react, but it does feel like you're confronted with this kind of um, almost caricature of tyranny, um, which is a hard word to use when you're talking about your own government because we're so inculcated to think that tyranny is something that happens elsewhere in bad countries. But to watch the U.S. government in its own documents, um, not just trying but coming very close to converting the internet into a realm of unlimited indiscriminate surveillance, which is another way of saying eliminating privacy in the digital age, um, is really stunning. But I think the more jarring part of it is how secretive it all was. So you watch your government that claims to be a democracy and claims to be accountable to its citizenry through the ballot box engaging in this indescribably consequential behavior and purposely keeping not just the details but the broad strokes of what they're doing completely secret from the people who are supposed to be deciding whether or not they want their government to be doing that. I mean, it's a real subversion not just of privacy but of democracy itself. And yeah, to watch it um, in, in, in action essentially and with the definitive proof of what they're doing definitely heightened my, my skepticism over the reliability of the U.S. government's claims, the role they play in the world and, and its motives as well. Have you been surprised or disappointed in any way with kind of the weak reaction against the NSA by a lot of the people on the left? It's been really, I mean, I, no, I haven't been surprised, um, in part because there were so many other 
policies that progressives or liberals or Democrats, whatever you want to describe them as being, um, pretended not just to oppose but to vehemently condemn and be offended by when it was done when they were done by George Bush right. um, and when Barack Obama was condemning them, and then they just stood by quietly, meekly acquiescing, if not outright endorsing. Um, Obama, once he was in power, embracing these same theories and sometimes even expanding them. So this kind of radical, grotesque form of progressive hypocrisy was something that I had become extremely accustomed to, um, had written about, um, and had just accepted as a fact of life. At the same time, the reaction to the NSA reporting on the conservative side was was actually quite mixed. Um, it is true there were a lot of conservatives who were consistent, meaning they defended eavesdropping in the Bush regime and they defended it when done under Obama and were hostile to the reporting. But a huge amount of the support for Edward Snowden and the reporting that we were doing came from the right as well as the left. Um, and in part, a lot of that was just as hypocritical as um, the hypocrisy on the left because a lot of those conservatives were perfectly fine with the NSA scandal under George Bush and suddenly got worried about individual privacy when a Democrat was in control. But a lot of it was this kind of small government, pro-individual privacy strain on the right that was offended by the idea of this level of government spying. And it was really interesting because there, it didn't break down at all along partisan or ideological lines. Um, and in fact, if you look at the first NSA vote to defund the bulk metadata collection program, the two sponsors were John Conyers and Justin Amash. You can't find more disparate members of Congress than those two. And the, the people that lined up behind them to do that were across the range of po the political spectrum. Ultimately, the big breakdown was more along demographic lines, um, where young people tend to support Snowden and to be really offended and alarmed by this kind of surveillance, while older people were more tolerant of it. Um, but the, the, the behavior of, the, of Democrats um, was completely predictable. Um, they they pretended to be hideously bothered by a much smaller scale amount of eavesdropping revealed under George Bush and then completely supportive of what was done under President Obama. Maybe you can help me clarify. I just want to qu quote you to you for a second. I think the only means of true political change will come from people working outside of that two-party electoral system to undermine it and to subvert it and to weaken it and to destroy it, not to try to work within it to change it. And I'm curious how far you take this because I know in other contexts you've actually written uh, endorsing certain candidates, right? right. Uh, certain candidates who are either against NSI spying or in some cases against the war on drugs. Even. Right. So, you know, I don't think it's an absolute um, proposition that no value can ever come from working within the political system. There is value that I had in my own work from having Russ Feingold on the Senate because he could call hearings on things that nobody else would call hearings on that could force some transparency. Um, there are people who introduce debates that nobody else would introduce, like when Jim Webb introduced the idea of prison reform and, and drug policy reform, a really courageous thing to do that very few other members of Congress would have done. So, it isn't that I don't think there's any value from working within the political process, and you're right, I've endorsed candidates, I've raised money for them, I've done it as recently as the last election cycle. Um, but what I'm really you know, crit critiquing there is, is the fact that the two pr primary parties, um, despite all these claims of a lack of bipartisanship and these claims that they can't get along, are in fact in accord on far more than they disagree on. And what they're in accord on isn't political or ideological uh, perspectives, it's the fact that they serve the interests of those who um, control and fund the political system. And the same prevailing permanent factions in Washington end up reigning supreme regardless of whether Democrats or Republicans win elections. Sometimes they exercise their power in the private sector and other times they exercise it in the public sector which have become almost merged, but the same interests end up being served. And so you can spend all your time and energy working to affect the outcome uh, political elections are the Democrats or the Republicans going to get empowered, um, but ultimately most of the weighty questions um, don't really end up being changed. Some do, but most don't, um, depending on, on that process.
Uh, as this year's uh, winner of the Lanny Friedlander Prize, um, can you just tell us a little bit about what that winning that prize means to you? You know, I'm, I'm thrilled to win the award for a couple reasons. Um, one is, almost instantly from the beginning of the time that I started writing about politics, it was clear to me that there are people on opposite sides of the political spectrum who are encouraged to view each other as implacable enemies who actually have far more in common with one another um, than they do often with the people who they think they're on the same side as. And so having this kind of coalition of people, it sort of began being conceived as a coalition of liberals and libertarians, but I think my views on that have become more complicated about what this coalition is and who's involved in it. Um, I try really hard never to be pigeonholable, um, ideologically or otherwise, um, because I want to make sure that I can work with people who, with whom I'm in agreement on a whole wider range of issues. Um, and I've done things in the past with Reason and, and have had a lot of agreement with the, the policies and editorial positions of Reason, so I'm, I'm thrilled to get recognition for that reason. Um, but also, I think that there, the, the, the much more relevant split politically um, is no longer left versus right or Democrat versus Republican, but has really become insider versus outsider. Um, and again, you saw this, I think, most prominently in the last year with that NSA vote I mentioned earlier, where the people who saved the NSA program of bulk, bulk medical data communication was the White House, Nancy Pelosi, and John Boehner, this kind of unholy trinity of establishment insiders who whipped all their um, sort of establishment members of Congress in defense of the NSA. And you had the kind of Tea Party outsiders with the outsiders outsiders on the left um, joining together to try and defund it. And this coalition has actually become more apparent in lots of different areas, including drug policy and penal reform and, and intervention and war questions. And so any kind of um, award that's based on encouraging or trying to um, recognize people who are trying to work outside of these establishment institutions and work against them is, is one that I'm really happy to receive. Do you have specific areas of overlap, do you think, between the left and the libertarian coalitions here? Absolutely. I mean, the question of, of of intervention in war um, has become, I think, a huge, um, hugely divisive issue on the right, where there are all kinds of um, conservatives, whether it be Ted Cruz or, or uh, Rand Paul, who are questioning the kind of Reagan-esque, you know, we have to, or John McCain um, pro-intervention posture in, in almost every single case, and, and often find common ground on the left. But even on economic questions, um, you know, when uh, it came time to try and audit the Fed, mm -hmm. um, a longtime cause of Ron Paul, he found a really important ally in Alan Grayson. Um, and it was only because they were able to then tap into liberals and libertarians um, were they able to get a bill passed. And, and on the whole question of, I mean, even if you look at um, the two kind of agita outside agitation movements of the last five years, which was Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party movement, perceived as polar opposites, they were both actually born out of anger over the bailout. Um, and so I think objections to crony capitalism and the kind of inherent corruption of how the public and private sectors are interacting um, are also commonalities among the left and the right. And those are some extremely significant issues. I mean, those, and, and then you add to that um, social issues as well, whether it be um, choice or, or marriage equality, where you find advocates um, of those positions on both the right and the left as well. So I think there's a lot more common ground than people typically um, recognize. Glenn Greenwald, it has been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Todd Cranin for Reason TV.